My name is Antonio Texero, and I'm talking, going to talk to you about patterns for testing Debian packages. So we can start with a brief uh, introduction to Debian CI. So Debian CI is a service that has the goal of uh, out providing automated testing for the entire Debian archive. So we, back in 2016, Auto Package Test was created. It was a a tool that allows you to have tests inside a Debian source package and then have the tests executed against those binaries, the binaries produced from that source package. And then it supports uh, running on, the, on your uh, regular system, supports running against uh, KVM machine, virtual machines, against LXC containers and all uh, several other types of uh, virtualization platforms. Then uh, there was also an idea circulating in Debian that we should probably run auto package sets for everything, but nobody did that. And then in 2014, I started uh, Debian CI uh, with a very simple system that uh, did things sequentially in a loop. And then it, uh, since then, I have been improving the system. We had a few uh, Summer of Code students helping me improve the system. So today, um, we, we have a system that works pretty well, uh, it's, it scales with large changes to the archive and we have plans for having uh, Debian CI gating uh, migration from a stable to test. So the idea is that if, you, if your package uh, has a new version and all its previous dependencies and, uh, still work, and the package itself still works on unstable, then you can migrate to testing faster instead of waiting for that number of days. And, and, and the, also the contrary, if your new upload breaks something, then it's going to it's going to be blocked from going to testing. Uh, so the MCI it records the test history for uh, your package. There you see the the history for the MCI itself, so it's back in the archive. And then it keeps oh, uh, nowadays six months of history, so uh, you, you have quite a lot of data there. So if, if you have a failing test there, you can look at the logs to see exactly what failed, uh, what, was the, what was the version of each package installed in the test system, and that kind of thing. Since uh, 2014, we have been in really improving our coverage of the archive. So Right now we have more or less 8,000 source package. Uh, when we began, we had only 100 and something package with tests. So we have we have been since then uh, doing a pretty good job as a community to uh, add coverage for our, our archive. So today we have more or less 28 percent of the archive. So that's source package. So we test are at source package level. And on average, we have been adding tests for 20 packages every day since then. So that's pretty nice. And in this process of proposing that we uh, in increase our usage of automated testing, I, I wrote several uh, test suites for several packages. I help people with, with uh, questions on how to test things. I look at, uh, at how a lot of packages were being tested, and I started to notice, noticing uh, similar uh, solutions. I started proposing similar solutions to different packages, and I, I thought I was always had the idea that, that those solutions should be documented. Then I started uh, thinking in terms of patterns, which is the, the, the main topic here. A, a pattern is a reusable documented solution to a Repeating problems, so it's you, you, you commonly used in design disciplines like architecture, like building architecture, and also software engineering. So you, if you've been around enough our area, you have probably seen this book, which is the classical uh, introduction to to the to the patterns way of looking at things to our. Discipline, discipline of software engineering. So this book was released in 1995. Today, uh, today I would say it's one of one of the classics for uh, software engineering, computer science. 
Uh, and this uh, was the first of a series of books on the team. On the team. So you have uh, patterns for enterprise application software, patterns for software architecture, and, and all kinds of patterns. And then uh, last year I noticed that there was going to be a patterns conference pretty close to where I, I live. So Buenos Aires is more or less close from home. And I decided that I would try to document these uh, patterns I, I have seen in the dev and CI context uh, and, and go there and help them and, and get, the, get them to help me improve this documentation so that it could be useful to the dev community. So um, they, they accepted my paper there. So this is the full reference. If you want to uh, download the PDF, you can download from that uh, address. Uh, in the dev of schedule, there is also a direct link to the PDF, so you can also download from there. And then, when you are documenting patterns, uh, usually you have a few common elements uh, in what we call a pattern catalog. So, that uh, original book on design patterns for object oriented systems, it's a pattern catalog. So, they have like 20 something patterns. In each of them have very, uh, very uh, defined sections. So usually, uh, in the, the 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 pattern, the the template we are using here is the pattern has a title, a context, which is uh, what in which situations you can use that pattern, a problem, which is what you want to solve, that, that's the, the problem that repeats in several uh, situations and you are documenting a solution for that. Then you have forces, which is uh, things you have to take into consideration before applying that pattern, uh, like um, compromises you have to make, um, drawbacks and advantages of doing that, and then you have a solution, you have a consequence, which is usually a discussion or uh, what are the consequences what's the consequences of applying that pattern, and then you have examples. So, usually there are several styles, several style, different styles of doing that. You can be either very, um, very explicit and have explicit sections for each pattern, or, or you can write uh, those sections in more like a storytelling way, where you, you have uh, a more fluid text without several, several sections. Keep that. So a little bit about that page, which is the specification that uh, defines how you uh, add this to a Debian package. So the main idea is to test the package in a context where it is installed in a user system. So you, you don't want to test like the contents of the source tree or the binaries you just built. You want to test what's installed in the in the user system. So that's why that page is called uh, testing as installed, right? that's testing package as installed. So let's see how that works. Uh, very simple introduction. So you need to have a Debian test control file, and then in there it is uh, the same format used for Debian control itself. So you have different paragraphs for different tests. If you have uh, tests uh, field, then that is a list of test programs which are uh, inside the Debian test directory. So in the first paragraph there at the top, you have uh, test 1 and test 2. Those are assumed to be two programs inside Debian tests and they have to execute and in in return 0. If they return anything different from 0, then we assume the test failed. Now, you can also uh, specify dependencies specific to each test. So, in the second paragraph, you see a net symbol, which means all the binaries produced from this source package, plus an extra package that only is, is only used, used for to run the tests. And then it will run the, the test three test program, and if that exits zero, the test passes, and otherwise it fails. And then, uh, more or less recent addition, instead of uh, specifying the name of the program, you can also use the test command field and specify the command directly. So uh, we noticed that uh, there are several test suites where you have 
you had like one line scripts to call, call some command to remove some test infrastructure or something. So it was added to the specification that you can actually insert the uh, command directly. And then you also need to have a test suite field in the source stanza of the main control. But if you are using the package source from Stretch and later, that's done automatically for you if you have uh, Debian test control. And then uh, the main implementation of the specification is auto package test. We also have um, a program in dev scripts that also implements the specification, but it's a year updated, it doesn't implement everything. So you should, uh, today, auto package test is the only complete implementation. So you, you can run it against a source package or a changes file with binaries. In that case, the test will use the binaries that you just built and are referenced, referenced inside the changes file. Or you can also run against the current directory, which is the third line in the this example. And the dash B says, if you don't need to build anything from this source package, just, just assume its binaries are already installed. And then on the bottom you see uh, the, some options for virtualization. So you, you can use QMU or LXC to have an isolated test where the, the corresponding binaries will be installed in that system and run. So now we are going to uh, look at the pattern themselves. So the first one is called reuses existing tests. And then uh, this first pattern is annotated with each part of the template so you guys can follow. So the context is upstream has tests uh, written. They are usually intended to run against the source tree, like unit test or something like that. They usually assume you are running them uh, after probably doing a build or something, but they are going to use binaries in libraries in the source directory. So and there are no, no tests for the installed package. And this is how the problem we want to solve. Then we, we have to take into, into consideration some forces. So the, the maintainer might lack the time or the skill to write proper install tests. So uh, it's, it's not always very easy to do this, uh, to do this testing. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we are, you already have the test that upstream wrote. So, one way of solving this problem in this context is you can implement the, the as installed test as a simple record program that calls the existing test provided by upstream. So you, you can just reuse whatever upstream intended to be used during the build. And then in that context, um, reusing unit tests is very useful for library packages. So uh, assuming you have your library installed, the, each unit test should pass. And also, if, if you have acceptance tests, that's also useful for applications. So one example of that is the Galaxy package. So upstream provides acceptance tests, which is actually the best case. So they don't assume anything about uh, the source tree or if you have views or not. It just assumes, it already assumes that everything is installed. So you can just call everything and then uh, handle errors and exit with non-zero if anything fails. So you don't have to uh, care too much about the specifics of this script. Then the second pattern is test the installed package, which is um, in the context of where, well, you want to test the installed package, right? So and the, pro the problem we have is that if the test exercises so the source tree, that doesn't exactly reproduce uh, a user system. So you, you want the test to, to actually test what's installed and not what's in the source tree. And sometimes if you, you have uh, absolute source code reference inside the code, so in Ruby or Python, there are constants that you can use to uh, reference uh, files relative to that um, to the test file and they try to load the, the code from the source tree instead of just assuming that everything is installed. And some other test suites are uh, uh, better behaved in that sense, 
in which they, they just assume everything is the right place and just use the, the hardware concept of the language to load libraries or core programs or something like that. Then you have you want to remove usage of programs and library code from the source tree if you fail of their installed counterpart. So you if you have a unit test that's loading uh, a Ruby module or a Python module from the source tree, you want to change that to to make it load code from the installed system. So when you do that, then you, you can actually simplify the tests. So if you, if you need to call a program, you just call it by name. It will be on path. You don't need to, uh, to handle uh, relative locations without that. You just call the program, it's there. If you have a library, you're just going to use the import or the require or the load instruction of the language you are working with. And not care where that is coming from because it's going to be coming from the system. And usually you don't have to build anything to run the tests. Except if the test programs themselves are compiled, so then you need to build those. One example, for instance, if, um, if you have this type of thing in your test suite, so ADTTMP is a variable that you can use to detect whether you are running that test suite on the auto package test or not. So in that case, so you can set up the test suite in a way that if you are not testing the installed package, then you can add like your source tree being directory to the path to the system path, and you can uh, add the, your source tree library directory to the uh, dynamic linker uh, load path. So then your test don't need to care where the where any programs or libraries are coming from. They can just link against uh, those libraries, and then if you are running those tests during the build, okay, they work against the build the build version. If you are running against the installed version, they also work because they are going to look for the installed version. Another example, uh, unfortunately, very common in Ruby programs. So they have stuff like that that manipulated the, the location of the test file to load something explicitly from the source, from the source directory. And then you just uh, beat upstream with a glue bat and just change to do the right thing and assume the test framework will uh, add the relevant directories to the path or not depending on the context. So this is very common, uh, having a package that you, are, you think you are testing the installed package, but it's actually testing what's in the source tree. And then if you have a different version in the source tree, then and from if you have different versions in the source tree and in the system, then all kinds of may happen. Another pattern is clean and disposable test bed. So we want the test to be repeatable. So if a test fails in Debian CI, you want to reproduce the same failure locally before you try to fix it. So uh, the problem we want to solve is make, making sure we can always reproduce uh, the environment that a user would get when installing that package on a clean system. So obviously if you want to reproduce, you want to automate. And then on the other hand, automation has an upfront cost, You're usually going to spend some time automating that. But in the long run, if you are going to run tests a thousand times, a hundred thousand times, a million times, and the, the, the upfront cost is worth it. So one way of uh, solving that is using virtualization and container technology to provide fresh test systems. So this is already implemented in the auto package test and it is something that you can use locally on your development machine. And that's something that DevSCI is also going to use uh, on the infrastructure. That has a few consequences. First, you, you, you need to make sure that your dependencies are correct, both on the binary package dependencies and the test dependencies. So everything needs to be there. If something is missing, your tests are going to fail. Um, you need, uh, if you need some uh, package to run the test, but not for the regular usage of the package, then that needs to be explicitly listed in the test control file. 
you can automate other things like um, if you are testing a web application that doesn't do the web server part automatically, you can automate that in the test script itself. And then that's going to be reused forever when you're running those tests. And, but you know, on the other hand, sometimes when you are writing the test, it's useful to be able to run them without having to spawn a fresh virtual machine and install everything from scratch. So it's useful to be able to run the test against your local system, but you, you should always uh, run against a clean system before uploading. A few examples, so auto package, as I said, auto package test supports different virtualization, including uh, none at all, so you, you can use auto package test itself to run tests against your local system. Uh, currently in Devon CI we use LXC containers and uh, I'm working to be able to switch to KubeMU in the future so we can test things that are kernel related like file systems, uh, kernel modules and the kernel itself and all that. And Ubuntu uh, uses both KubeMU and LXC depending on the architecture. Uh, one interesting pattern is knowledge known failures. Sometimes you have a, a package that has a very long test suite, lots of tests, it's nice, but uh, most of the tests pass and some of them fail. <coughs> and there are several reasons why a test may fail. Uh, of course, ideally you want everything to pass, so that's what you want usually, but that's not, not always possible. You need to investigate the failures, uh, sometimes figure out why exactly uh, one out of a thousand tests fail is not exactly trivial, depending on how much you know the internals of the package and all that. So you need to consider how severe is each failure. Is that, uh, are all features and corner cases really, uh, really important? If there are a thousand tests, there are a few failing, maybe those are uh, non-issues or the test might be broken or has different expectations uh, regarding being executed from the source tree or not. So, and you also have to take into account how much effort you need to fix the test. So a solution for that is to make the failures you already know about non-fatal. So, that fails, okay, we know and we acknowledge that, but then we are not going to fail the, the test run because of that. So when you do that, uh, your, the test that you have that pass, which we expect to be the majority of them, you act as a regression test suite, so if they continue passing, then everything is good. And if you, the non-test fail, that's okay, you tolerate that. Uh, then you are probably going to maintain like a blacklist of tests that you know that fail but you, don't, you, you can't really deal with them right now and then you can use that as a to-do list to, to fix. So those tests might, might be broken for a, a host of different reasons. And then you, you also have to take into consideration that you can't leave those tests uh, failing forever so you, you need to uh, keep an eye on that. So this is an example from the Ruby source package. So uh, there are a few tests there that assume, that assume being run from the source tree and they don't really work when you try to run against the installed package. So uh, we maintain a blacklist in a file called nonfailures.txt inside the test directory. So what this code is doing is running each test and checking if a failed, failed test is in the blacklist. If it's in blacklist, then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fail the, the, the test run. So at the end, you get a result. So you have n tests that passed, n tests that fail, but we already knew they failed. And if any test that's not in that blacklist fails, then the test run actually fails. Otherwise, we just tolerate the ones that you know we are broken for now and go, along, go ahead. Now, uh, another pattern called automatically generated test metadata. This is very important, it is one of the reasons why we, we were able to add tests to so many packages so far. 
usually when you are working with a team, you have uh, you have several sim similar packages, and the, the the code to run the test for those packages is very similar. And usually the upstream community will have uh, conventions on how to run the test. So if you have Python package, it's always Python setup.py test. Um, if you have a uh, per package, it's always make tests and this kind of thing. So you, you would end up uh, having several duplicated test definitions if you're going to, to have to do that explicitly all the time. And duplication, of course, is bad. Uh, on the other hand, some packages can be uh, tested a little different than others, so you, you need to take into consideration that maybe you are not going to deduplicate everything. Then a solution for that is to repl uh, replace uh, these duplicated test definitions which one, with ones that you generate at runtime. So in Debian we do this with a, with a tool called AutoDepH which is able to detect uh, which type of package you have and then generate the, the appropriate test definition for that package. Then in, in, when you, we do that, if you, if you need to change how the tests are run, then you can change that in one place only and not have to change a lot of packages by hand. And also, you, you can also automate things to manage the test environment centrally. For instance, if you want to have a, have a workaround that makes sure that a, a given type of package always loads code from the system and not from the source tree, then you can do that in a single place. For instance, um, for Ruby packages, uh, out of that page will generate something like that, calling gen, gen to that test runner, which is the test runner we have in the Ruby team, and it, it already handles all that thing of uh, making sure the test is not going to load code from the source tree, and it does that when you, you use the dash dash auto package test parameter. And then when we need to change anything about that, we can just change in a single place in the gentle lab test run package and not need to change in more than a thousand packages. So after that page also supports Perl, Python, Node.js, GKMS, R, Elpa, which are Emacs something packages, and Go. So if you are if you are in a team that's not supported yet, you can also uh, send a patch to add support for your type of package. It's very easy to, to do that with uh, everyone. Every of those supported languages were added by system. other people than myself, so it's really easy. People didn't have really a problem with doing that. Uh, smoke test is another pattern. Uh, you have to realize that sometimes not all packages will provide tests. And sometimes you have features that are not really provided by upstream, like features from maintenance scripts or features that uh, are, are added by the Debian maintainer when adding a certain definition and stuff like that. So in that context, uh, the maintainer wants, wants to add tests to make sure that high-level functionality works. You have to take into consideration that um, uh, it's not always easy to test the internals of the package. Again, depends on how much you understand the details of that package and how, you, how familiar you are with the technologies that are used there. And also, you, you can always have tests that are specific to the Debian package. That test some integration with Debian specific, that's specific to Debian that doesn't really make sense to be done upstream. So you can write smoke tests to exercise uh, features of the package and check for expected results. Uh, the idea is that a smoke test covers uh, either the main functionality or and or most uh, very basic functionality of a package. And the, the analogy there is if there is smoke then probably there is fire. So smoke test is something that you can run easily, quickly. And if that fails, there is the most basic functionality fails, then 
there's probably a larger problem that you have to, you need to investigate. And if you think about it, even a very simple uh, test case like just calling your program with dash dash version can already catch uh, breakage, so such as silent API changes. So a library maintainer uh, made a mistake, didn't realize an API change upstream, and then just uh, your program doesn't load properly anymore. So you can catch that type of stuff. You can catch issues with dependencies uh, if there is anything invalid with libraries or anything in your program. It's not going to work even for just printing its version number. You can catch things like invalid instructions. So I, we saw that sometimes with Power PC 64, where you had like a Power 7 machines in the beginning of the of the port, and now you have Power 8 machines, and then the binaries that are very old didn't really work anymore with the with the new machines. Uh, so just running the program doing very few things is going to help you catch that. Also, you can catch packaging issues. Uh, there's a bug in the package and the, the main program is not being installed anymore. So the test is going to fail and you're going to catch that. So this is an example from the chef package. So very basic call. It's just called with a recipe that says, uh, please install the Vim package in this system. And then you can just you test that the Vim package installed. So if that succeeds, then it means that the check is installed properly. All the dependencies are there. And, uh, at, at least so far as you need for this test case, they, they are okay. And then uh, if anything like that is broken, then you have a, a failing test. The last pattern is record interactive session. Uh, we have to realize that some packages are older than the trend of having auto such a thing as automated tests. So sometimes you really don't have tests. Uh, sometimes it's not really easy to write automated tests up front. So when you are experimenting with something, you don't really know how the interface is going to be. So it's hard to uh, to foresee which type of test you want and then you want to provide tests for, the, for a package like that and you realize that some programs will have a clear interface with the rest of the system so that interface can be a command line interface, can be a graphical interface but can also be a, a, a server socket that is distant to, a, to some protocol like a web server or something like that and then one, one way of writing tests in that context is uh, recording sample interactions with the program so that you can play that back later as automated tests. So uh, the way to do that is you install the package on a clean test bed, like a clean VM or a clean container. You exercise that interface, you call the command line or you make a request to, the, to an HTTP port and you record what happens and you compare that with your expectation or with the documentation uh, and, and, you, and then you go ahead and record that interaction in, in an executable format. So th there are several ways of doing that, depends on the tool that you are using. But here is an example of uh, a tool that I really like and it's very interesting. So uh, you can easily imagine having that session there as a shell session which you, you ran a few commands, you have outputs, and then you just copy and paste that into a file. And actually there is a tool that does that for you. So if you take that file and feed it to CLI test, it will actually uh, detect that each uh, line that starts with a dollar sign is a command that needs to be run, and everything below that is the output that you expect. So it, it will run the command for you, it will check the output, it, it, you, it will use each command as a test for you and then you have, just like that, you have six tests and you can easily do that for other command line programs and it's, it's really useful. Then, uh, to finalize, uh, so we have a set of patterns that uh, documented uh, 
uh, design issues when you are working with auto package tests. Uh, I hope they are useful to you. Again, the full paper is available, you can read that. It's going to be linked from the DevNCI website documentation at some point. Uh, you might have noticed that some patterns solve the same problem. So this is normal, so you have different solutions uh, for the same problem. You, that may depend on the context, may depend on other restrictions you have, uh, be that time restrictions or effort restrictions or uh, platform restrictions. So it's normal to have uh, different solutions to the same problems. And uh, if you can identify other patterns, I would be uh, delighted to discuss. You can talk to me, I'll be here until Saturday. So we can expand this catalog and keep this documentation for help, helping people deal with uh, adding tests to their backends. <coughs> then uh, I, I, I went a little uh, fast over the details of how exactly you do the testing. So uh, I would like, I'd like to plug uh, a both session you have on Friday on the pool room. So 15.30 on Friday we're going to discuss everything related to CI and the package test. So you have uh, questions or want to uh, exchange ideas about the topic, we can meet there. And then a few reference if you want to learn more, there's the paper PDF. Uh, the DevNCI documentation has pointers to uh, everything that you need to know. And then in Depo 15, I, I, I made a talk that was a lot uh, more detailed about the specifics of how you write tests and you know, the different options and the different tools. So you can also check it out. And that's all I have. I'm not sure if you have time for questions or not. And then you can run the same test against both, for instance. Um, but uh, that would not be uh, present, for example, on CI. All oh, right. Yeah, it's not there now, but it could be. We can do that if there is interest. If people really want to maintain System 5 forever, why not? Okay, thank you.